Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Iran Eden. Dr. Eden is the founder and CEO of MeMed since its inception in 2009. Iran led the company from an idea that was born in his grandmother's kitchen, I'm told, to a rapidly growing company today with two CE Mark products in Europe and in Israel, and as of two weeks ago, a landmark FDA approval in the United States. Dr. Iran Eden has a uh, background in biology and engineering, has over 100 patents, and authored 30 publications. Dr. Eden. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, enjoy the lunch. Little correction, it was not in my grandma's kitchen. It was in Kfir Ovid's grandmother's kitchen, even though my grandmother would love to take credit for that. So that's the other co-founder. Okay, the topic for today is, is it a bacterial or viral etiology? Uh, using host response technologies to decode the immune system and aid in antibiotic stewardship. A quick overview of the company. Headquartered in Israel, building a growing base right now in Boston. It raised well over $100 million in equity, plus over $30 million from the U.S. Department of Defense and the European Commission. MEMET is based on this simple idea. Idea that is the immune system, our immune system, has evolved to tell us what's going on in our bodies. And what we do, we listen to the immune response, develop technologies that read out the immune response in real time, and provide insights to clinicians that can potentially help transform the way that we manage patients with acute infections and inflammatory disorders. It always starts with a clinical challenge, with a clinical scenario. So imagine a child coming to the ED, say with fever without source, suspected lower respiratory tract infection, or maybe an adult with, again, a suspected lower respiratory tract infection. Several questions come to mind. The first one, is it a bacterial or a viral etiology? Do we treat or not treat with antibiotics. Now, if you ask clinicians, some of the stats talk about that roughly 35% of cases coming to the ED still have significant uncertainty regarding the underlying etiology after completing clinical examination and receipt of lab results. So that's one in three patients. Now, as a result of that, antibiotics are not only overuse, one in every second anti one in every second case that has a viral infection, one in every three cases of viral infection are receiving erroneous antibiotics, that's the overuse part. There's also an underuse. One in five patients that have a bacterial infection are not receiving antibiotics on time, which also has grave consequences. Some of the consequences of that includes the rise of resistant strains of bacteria, arguably, arguably one of the biggest healthcare challenges of our time. 2.8 resistant infections in the U.S. annually, with 35,000 deaths, again, in the U.S. annually, according to CDC. So it's a big challenge. Now, we have, obviously, many conventional tests from cultures, PCRs, rapid antigen tests, single biomarkers, and they're good, and they're driving the field forward. So why do we still have a challenge? There's several gaps that remain. Let me see if I can move a little bit. I'm Israeli, so I tend to talk with my hands and move, but I'll try to stay here behind the podium. Okay. So conventional tests. Number one, we want our solution. Here are some gaps. We want our solutions to work very rapidly, preferably within minutes, not an hour, not several hours, definitely not several days. Second, we want it to diagnose inaccessible infections. For example, otitis media, sinusitis, bronchitis, pneumonia, fever without source, where we don't know where the infection site is. That's one in four patients in the most prevalent indication on earth, a child with a fever or an adult with coughs. Third, even if you apply a multiplex PCR, it, say in cases of a respiratory tract infection, in roughly 50% of the cases, you're not going to detect any microorganism. So what do you do? Then if you do detect a microorganism, say in influenza, what does that mean? Often we have co-infections, bacterial co-infections, particularly influenza, but also in some other viruses. And lastly, if we identify viruses, we don't always know that that virus, especially in the respiratory tract, is the disease-causing agent and not just a mere colonizer or part of the natural flora. Again, statistics, rhinoviruses in the nasopharynx of two-year-old children occur in about 50% of healthy, 40 to 50% of healthy, otherwise asymptomatic children. 
So the vision behind MIMED is the following. We imagine this small digital device, which I'll show you today, that with a small volume of blood in a few minutes would somehow help answer this seemingly simple problem. Is it a bacterial viral etiology? Do we treat or not treat antibiotics? And the paradigm is as following. So we do real-time quantification of the body's immune response coupled with machine learning. So we, set, we measure a set of proprietary soluble proteins that circulate in the blood. And then with a competition layer, we basically create a barcode and a simple answer, bacterial versus viral infection. There's another accompanying product called MIMID Universal Severity that answers a complementary question, whether that patient in front of us has a severe outcome or not, whether to escalate treatment or not, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. Today the focus is on the MIMID BV. Now, ideas are cheap. Making products is hard. Getting cleared is even harder. So what I'll do right now in the next few minutes is going to share with you or collapse, compress a 10-year journey into four minutes uh, from four years of discovery, about five years of six years of product development, seven years of clinical validation, and then recently European clearance and two weeks ago we announced a landmark FDA clearance. So I'll share with you about that. So you start, first of all, where do you find these hypothetical molecules? I mean, you can look at the transcriptomic level, proteomic level, cellular level. We chose proteins because they're easier to measure once you find what you want to measure. And eventually, after running for four years what was arguably the largest proteomic screening ever to be conducted of the human response to acute infections, we came out with, we started with about 100,000 potential protein and protein isoforms bioinformatically, then measured 600 proteins in a quantitative manner, 1,002 patients prospectively, came up with three proteins. I'll share these proteins with you. The first one is called TRAIL. TRAIL, see? TRAIL is actually the world's first virally induced protein that's used as part of routine care. It shoots up in your bloodstream when you have a viral infection whether it's influenza A, influenza B, RSV, parainfluenza, coronas. And it has this unique property that it goes down when you have a bacterial infection. And it's just been cleared again by FDA. Every dot that you see here is a patient from a three-month-old baby to a 93-year-old lady, from hypochondriacs that come after they sneeze and those that come after a week. That's important because different biomarkers have different temporal dynamics. Uh, again, different pathogens, different comorbidities, but it's not perfect. We don't have a perfect biomarker, nor do we believe they exist, so we use a combination of several biomarkers together. The other biomarker is called IP10. It's an infectious disease biomarker, also implicated in lung injuries, received a lot of headlines recently in the context of COVID. And lastly, good old C-reactive protein that's been around for about 40 years now. Um, it's a general marker for inflammation and goes predominantly in bacterial infections, but also some inflammatory disorders. And we basically combine all the three using, again, machine learning and produce a score between zero and 100. The higher the score, the higher the likelihood of a bacterial infection. Mixed infection, mixed bacterial and viral core infections will receive a high score because from a Clinician perspective, you want to treat with antibiotics. So it's very, very pragmatic. The system is designed to help make real actions in real time. You can see that there's an equivocal zone. About 10% of the cases will land in the, in the equivocal zone. Most of the cases will either have a score between 0 and 10 or 90 to 100. So this was the first study. It was published in 2015. and was met with quite a lot of skepticism. It's not enough that you as a company say that something works. You need external, not internal, prospective, double-blind studies by multiple groups around the world. And that's exactly what we did for the last seven years. We basically provided this technology to multiple groups, and they started publishing this independent of the company. Here you see some of the studies that came out. So for example, the one here on the left called Opportunity is a 777 patient prospective double-blind study led by Professor Louis Bond. Uh, looking at children three months to 50 months old, uh, pain point with fever without source, a pain point uh, that we have today that was published in The Lancet and some additional publications. Recently, it just became topic and up to date. So in total, we have over 20 clinical studies, and some of which are finished and some of which are ongoing, over 30 collaborators, over 20,000 patients, both uh, 
prospective data and real world data. So what does that mean? How does this map to some of the challenges that we just talked about? For example, overcoming the challenge of hard to obtain clinical samples, particularly suspected lower respiratory tract infections. So here we see two studies, one for pediatrics and one for elderly patients with LRTI, lower respiratory tract infections, where Again, for about four or five years, independent groups were running those and were able to establish the same performance, sensitivity, and specificity on the order of 91, 92%. Sensitivity is the accuracy by which we detect bacterial infections, specificity, viral infections. Here you see the ROC curve, the area under severe operating curve, compared to some of the other biomarkers or clinical parameters that we routinely use from what blood count, monocytes, absolute neutrophil counts, Etc. And here you see a comparison to some of the other biomarkers that you would expect from procalcitonin and uh, interleukin-6, etc. If we zoom in on procalcitonin, which is basically the only cleared product today by FDA for antimicrobial stewardship, you see that procalcitonin has a very high specificity, but hard to obtain a high sensitivity, which has been well recorded also in the literature. So here you get basically on the left, as you can see, both a high performance and sensitivity and specificity. So this is on the biomarker side, but that's not good enough. I think the, you know, medical history is littered with a lot of cool technologies that didn't really fit into the workflow. And the challenge that we have is that some of the proteins that we're measuring are picogram per ml, some are nanogram per ml, and some are microgram per ml. And we need a very, very, very tight CV, which is a big challenge. We tried to use some off-the-shelf technologies for several years. We failed miserably, frankly. And we had to go and develop our own technology. We use this internal joke internally that measuring the picogram per ml is equivalent to having a soccer field covered with about two kilometers of M&Ms. You hand a, hide a random number between a zero and a thousand skills. You have to go and count the skills. You have 15 minutes to go. I posed this question to my daughters. They said, Daddy, there's no problem. We just eat the M&Ms and we leave aside the skills. So apart from my daughters that have superpowers, I guess all the other folks on this planet have to find a different technology. So again, fast forward. It took us about six years to develop this. This is called Mimit Key. It was developed or initially headed by our other co-founder, Dr. Kfir Oved, with engineers and chemists on four continents. A pretty big effort. Basically, if you want to understand how it works like, how, how, what's the underlying mechanism, it's based on chemiluminescence, magnetic beads. So imagine a, a lenity, a telica, a liaison. They actually know how to measure picogram per mil. It's actually the only robust way that we can do that today. So it's a large liaison or alinity, just miniaturized to a 10 by 10 by 12 inch box. And let me just show how it works. So you put the serum sample right now, 100 microliters in the cartridge. You plug it inside the device. You press the start button. And that's it, frankly. Boring. So you get a quantitative measurements of the single biomarkers, plus a qualitative interpretation, plus the score. In this case, you see a one high likelihood of a viral infection. The device itself can do picogram, nanogram, and microgram per mil with a very tight CV, measures multiple proteins, rapid results within minutes. We can do this right now in 15, one, five minutes in serum, and also working on whole blood and capillary blood. It's designed to be CLIA waivable, and it can also measure, and we're adding more menu, basically any protein in your body from oncology, wellness, and veterinarian. So wrapping this part, using the immune response is not just a cool, geeky nuance. Sure, it's cool. We're using you to diagnose you, but who cares? It turns out that by flipping the problem upside down, you're able basically to solve these challenges or gaps we've talked about. You can do it within minutes, measuring proteins. You can diagnose inaccessible infections because the immune system circulates throughout the entire body. While multiplex PCRs don't, don't provide a result every time, this technology does because the immune system did find the bug, even, our, even though our multiplex PCR didn't. We actually can identify co-infections. I'll show it's part of the study that we did for FDA clearance. And we are also able to show that we're not sensitive or robust to colonization. OK, moving to the next topic, FDA clearance. And this is something we've been working in tight collaboration with FDA for over five years to further establish performance in a large prospective a double blind multi center study focused on patients upon admission, EDs, and urgent cares. So, this is the FDA's first clearance of a technology to aid to distinguish between, between bacterial and viral infections using the body's immune response, coupled with machine learning. 
The clearance is both for the test and the platform. Um, and of course, there's a huge elephant in the room. The challenge is how do you actually prove performance in the absence of a real, true gold standard? So again, it took us several years to figure this one out, together with our colleagues here that you see uh, on the bottom, multiple, again, uh, leading centers uh, in the nation. We passed both the primary and secondary endpoint with flying colors. And again, the data is going to be published soon. We'll give you a peek about that today. In terms of indications, we received a pretty broad indication for use. So Nemet BV is indicated for both children above three months old and adults. It's indicated for distinguishing or aiding in distinguishing between bacterial and viral etiologies in suspected acute infections. That means lower spiritual tract infections, upper spiritual tract infections, fever without source, urinal tract infections, systemic infections. And it's indicated for EDs, urgent cares, and samples collected at the hospital admission. Last thing I want to show you is one of the things that we have in our IFU right now is that Mimid BV can identify bacterial co-infections in viral positive PCR patients. And so this is actually data from the study. Every dot here, so for every one of those patients, we actually ran multiplex PCRs. In about half of the patients, we identify a microorganism. And then we have a panel adjudication process to try to figure out what the patient actually had. So what you see here on the left, the blue dots, viral patients, the orange dots, bacterial, co-infected patients. The y-axis is the score from 0 to 100. And what you can see, that those patients that had a bacterial co-infection had a score that skews upwards towards the 100, which means we can identify bacterial co-infections and complement positive PCRs. And here, then to the right, you see there a breakdown for other types of viruses from influenza a, a and B, which are very friendly viruses. They bring along many of their bacterial friends up to RSVs and adenos, what have you, what have you. This is some clinical testimonials and case studies. So we actually launched Mimid BV initially in Israel and are already starting to use this to guide patient treatment. And there's some pretty interesting cases, both of reduction and of overuse, but also underuse. And yeah, I guess this week, we opened here a booth. This is the first time we're presenting this in the US. So you're all welcome to visit the booth. Thank you very much. Is there, I think there's a place for a QA, and a I believe. So just feel free. Okay, I'm getting the yes, okay. So, so the question was, is there a correlation between the Mimid BV score and sepsis? The sepsis, the answer is yes. So again, sepsis, as long as you talk about sepsis, a bacterial sepsis. If you're talking about a bacterial sepsis, then yes, there's a, there's a correlation in the sense that the more severe the case, the easier it is for the system to pick up on the case. So if you look, for example, at the performance on general upper respiratory tract infection, it will be on the order of 91%, 92% AUC. But as you move to the more severe cases, LRTI and definitely the sepsis, bacterial sepsis, you get close to 98, 99, what have you. So, so there is some because, and again, that makes sense. The immune response in these cases reacts in a much more pronounced manner. So we pick up on those signals. Thanks, great question. Any additional questions? Platform. Okay, so the question was, I believe, are we thinking of developing additional tests on the platform? The, the answer is absolutely yes. So, so there's a series of tests that we're developing, both proprietary and conventional. Conventional, let's start with the conventional. So, so here's the thing. One of the nice things about the platform, people think often that the, the, the challenge is to develop a nice box. The hard part is actually the manufacturing and standardization. 
And because it uses chemiluminescence magnetic beads, the same type of chemistry that you have on the large automated muon machines, you can actually transfer essays that work on a large box and make them work in a relatively more standardized fashion in a small point of need format. So we are right now exploring that with potential partners. That's number one. And the more you need time, accuracy, and multiplexity, the more I think we have an added value. Second, we do have tests that we're developing. I mean, if you had a white canvas of using the immune response, we have biobanks including tens of thousands of samples. We can basically run this device, any protein. You can actually do a lot of other additional stuff. One of the things that we've announced, we had this project called Mimid Universal Severity. Basically, the question there is the same question, the same patient comes, say, uh, add elderly patient with suspected lower spiritual tract infection, severe versus non-severe, do I escalate treatment or not, say, in the interest of the ED. And then this little virus hit us, COVID-19, and we utilized this technology to develop a, techno a te technology, that, a product that we called Mimit COVID Severity, which basically allows you to determine up to two weeks in advance a severe outcome defined as ICU level of care and mortality. That product just got cleared in Europe a few weeks ago, and uh, we're right now working with FDA in very tight collaboration to explore how we can bring this to the US as well. So that's another example of a proprietary test that we're working right now that has a lot of need, we believe, in these days. Thanks for the question.